Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Brady. I am a maritime researcher and the producer behind the channel Ocean Liner Designs, with a particular interest, specialization in the history of the Titanic. And we've done a little bit of the history of the movie, the film Titanic from 1997, on this channel before, but what I thought we could do today was actually take a little bit more of a deep dive and react to some of the more iconic scenes in the film and see what we can take out of them. When this film came out, it was a, a blockbuster in every sense of the word, and it is iconic today for a number of reasons, but it certainly has a lot to answer for because it got a lot of people like me interested in the story of this great ship and its, its fascinating history. So today, let's have a little look through the film at some of the more iconic scenes and pull out some little historical goodies. What do you think? Titanic was called the ship of dreams. And it was. In this particular scene, Old Rose refers to Titanic as being known as the ship of dreams. But it really wasn't. No one, uh, to my knowledge, ever used that terminology to describe Titanic. Marketers and the publicists for the White Star Line, the booking agents used really generic terms for ships in this era. So often on posters from that time, you see things like the greatest steamers in the world or the grandest ships in the world, that kind of thing. Weirdly, Titanic and her sister ship Olympic were referred to as the queen of the seas at a certain point in their career. So when Titanic was brand new, she was referred to at some point in a poster as the queen of the seas, but never as the ship of dreams. That's a new one that I think was made for the, uh, for the film. Brilliant scene, beautifully set. This, of course, shows Titanic on the day of her sailing from Southampton, April 10th, 1912. So this is the White Star dock with the uh, the big sheds where passengers would have been expected to go through. So you can actually see those earlier in the clip. The other thing that's interesting about this scene is that it shows Southampton bathed in sunlight and it's a beautiful sunny day. And we actually have photographs of Titanic's departure and it's not a nice sunny day. It's very overcast. It's very grey. It's very classic Britain. This is interesting because some people put this down as... This is the way Rose is remembering things as an old lady. So she kind of is maybe glamorizing it a little bit, but yeah, wouldn't have looked so grandiose if it was a, uh, if it was a beautiful overcast day. It doesn't look any bigger than the Mauritania. It's over a hundred feet longer than Mauritania and far more luxurious. Here, Rose's fiance, Cal, is uh, trying to really upsell the somewhat unimpressed Rose on Titanic. And it's interesting that she's comparing it to the Mauritania. This tells us that she may have travelled in a previous voyage on the Cunard steamship Mauritania. And uh, the reason that's a nice little Easter egg that James Cameron, the director, and his, uh, his team have dropped in there is because Mauritania and Lusitania, the two Cunard sister ships which preceded Titanic, actually directly inspired the construction of Titanic and her sister ship Olympic. So this is actually a little nod to that generation of ships before Titanic that had actually inspired it in the first place. Those two companies had a decades-old rivalry. And Titanic was, as Cal pointed out, 100 feet longer than Mauritania. But was it more luxurious? This is, this is one that's up for debate. Titanic is in some places absolutely beautiful, there's no doubt about it. But in other places, Harland and Wolf, the shipbuilders, used very kind of copy-paste design methodology. They used a lot of interiors that they'd used on other ships from the recent past. And actually, they just kind of upscaled a lot of interior designs that they'd used. So if you compare photographs of the interiors of ships from the Big Four, which was uh, the series of White Star transatlantic ocean liners before Titanic, you can actually see that a lot of the space is very, very, very similar to what you'd see on Olympic and Titanic, just scaled up. And it's just an interesting way of going about design compared to the Mauritania, which was through and through a fairly unique ship and uh, extremely beautiful. There's no doubt about it. Titanic had a beat in terms of size, but Mauritania was was pretty comfortable if you were traveling in first class. So whether or not it is far more luxurious is up for debate. But to be fair, I don't think this is a, an error in any way. This is Cal obviously buying into the hype. The booking agents did everything they could to try and get people to, to book tickets on their ships. And in the same way that airlines today advertise their aircraft as being the most comfortable or what have you, um, back then they put a huge emphasis on on the comfort and luxury to try and get people to book tickets in the first place. You can see in this scene people of all different classes and backgrounds, and this is really interesting because Titanic 
was obviously carrying three classes. This is one of those facts that, that everybody knows. It was first, second, and, and third class. And later on in the scene, you see Jack um, lie to an officer and say that he's been through the inspection queue. And at another point, you can see a passenger having his beard checked with a comb for lice. And this is really important because sickness at sea in a ship like that is a very confined space. As we know in our post-COVID-19 world, that sickness in a confined space is not a good thing. And in fact, Titanic's sister ship Olympic, after the First World War, had to be quarantined in New York for the better part of a week because there was an outbreak of illness on board and the ship had to be held up because of it and nobody could get off, which is obviously extremely annoying when you're trying to get somewhere quickly. It was a huge holdup. And so they did everything in their power to make sure that passengers were boarding that had been inspected, that had been checked for illnesses, typhoid. This is in the era before wide scale usage of, of vaccines and, and things that we have today that we might take for granted. So back then they went through a lot of effort to make sure that sickness could be contained. And in fact, Titanic had an infectious hospital on board. She had a hospital um, with normal wards, with normal bunks, and then an infectious hospital separate. So you can see that infectious diseases were, were of the utmost importance to avoid for the operators of ships like this. So there's no way that Jack would be able to just jump the inspection queue like that. They just wouldn't let it happen because he could be carrying cholera or typhus or any one of these illnesses that could result in, a, in an outbreak on board the ship. So it just can't be done. There's a, a funny little moment here where the Titanic's propellers begin to turn and you'll notice that the central propeller is immediately engaged. It starts turning straight away, but that was actually not possible in real life because the central propeller was turned and operated by a low pressure steam turbine, which was different to the engines outboard of that, the ones that operated the other two propellers on either side of it they would be engaged directly by the, the engines actually turning the crankshaft and then turning the propeller. But the central propeller needed to take the steam that was being funneled and vented out of those two main engines into the turbine, which would then begin to slowly rotate like a fan. And that would turn the central propeller, but it took a lot of steam pressure to get to that, to get to that point. Titanic needed to be going at a fair clip for the central propeller to actually begin to move. And in this scene, it starts straight away, but... That's not really a big deal. Titanic's departure was not smooth sailing, pardon the pun, like it's shown here. We know, and it's kind of fairly well known, that Titanic almost immediately ran into disaster as it was leaving the, the port of Southampton. Shortly after this sequence, Titanic passed uh, a row of ocean liners that were, were tied up and um, with, with onlookers on board watching Titanic go past. And this was actually a lot of ocean liners that were quite famous around the world. Two of them were the Oceanic and New York. And Oceanic and New York were of the generation of ocean liner, about two generations or three generations before Titanic, that for their time were the largest and most luxurious in the world. But obviously Titanic had far, far surpassed that standard by the time she had been built. So Titanic displaces about 50 odd thousand tons of water, which means that she's sitting low in the water, she's beginning to move, and all this, this momentum is actually drawing water in around her. So as she passed New York and the Oceanic, there was the sound of like a cannon going off, and, and then another one. And what was happening was, as Titanic was passing these two ships, the strain of Titanic passing, displacing this water and sucking these two smaller ocean liners in actually caused them to be drawn in towards the ship and New York detached from her moorings. And the lines which connected her to the shore, the same kind of lines that we saw those, those crew a little earlier coiling, snapped. And what's remarkable about that is the fact that you can see it here that these, uh, these ropes, these lines are unbelievably heavy duty. They were called hawsers, and they were basically the thickness or the diameter of a small tree trunk. And the fact that Titanic was pulling in the New York with such force that her mooring lines snapped was just remarkable. And nobody could have foreseen it. This is new technology. Ships of this size hadn't really visited Southampton before, so this was all brand new, and obviously something went horribly wrong. But at the last minute, Titanic's captain was able to engage his engines, put them astern, 
slow the ship down, prevent any more suction, and then to prevent those two ships from actually making contact, a tugboat very heroically got in between them and prevented a, a collision. Because of course, if Titanic had actually hit the ship New York and there was damage caused, that would have been it for the maiden voyage. It would have been moored again and postponed while the damage was, was taken care of. And that would have been it. Ironically, tragically, Titanic would have missed her maiden voyage and she probably would have missed the iceberg because of it. And it's one of these weird little twists of fate that Titanic very, very nearly was saved from the iceberg before even leaving the port of Southampton because of a near disaster. It's not shown in the film. It's not really pertinent to anything involving the main characters. So obviously it's, it's glossed over. So this has got to be one of the most iconic scenes in the film, when Titanic's engines worked up to full speed once she's left the Irish coast and she's heading for the open ocean. And what's really interesting about this is they filmed this on a real steamship, um, which had used engines very similar to Titanic's, although at a much smaller scale. You can see here they're stories tall, about three stories tall, and they're the size of small buildings each. Each engine weighed between 700 and 900 tons. Very impressive pieces of machinery. And the man at the centre of it all is Chief Engineer Joseph Bell, who was from the very north of England, and he was a White Star Line veteran. You actually see him in the clip here represented. He's a very proud man. He had been on board Olympic, Titanic's uh, sister ship, the one that had actually gone before her and completed the maiden voyage just fine. And he had worked those engines up, and he had overseen the running of the ship on its maiden voyage. So for him... This was fairly run-of-the-mill stuff. There must have been a lot of excitement, a lot of pride to actually be in charge of this machine. But Bell and his men were used to running these things, and so this was a, a routine assignment, but there must have definitely been some pride about being the first to take a ship like this to, to open ocean and working those three-story tall engines up to full speed for the first time. This angle here in real life would have been impossible. You would have been staring at a blank wall. Where Joseph Bell is standing right now, Behind him would have been the turbine room, where that third engine that I was telling you about would have sat nestled in between tons and tons of other machinery, like pumps and things like that. But obviously for, uh, for storytelling's sake, we get this fantastic open view of the engine room with Bell looking up proudly at his uh, machines as they get to work. So where Jack is standing in this scene is a funny kind of spot. It's right at the very tip of Titanic, the place called the prow of the ship. And uh, he really shouldn't be there. There was a breakwater just behind him designed to deflect waves if they crashed over the bow of the ship. And on that breakwater was a sign which essentially said, no passengers are allowed forward of this. So Jack's kind of breaking the rules here. But I don't know how strictly maintained and enforced that rule is might have actually been in real life. The reason they didn't want passengers up there is because there's a ton of very scary machinery that at the very least you can trip over and hurt yourself, or break an arm or something like that. If it was operating when they were in port though, it was a completely different story because these machines are small steam engines, they're steam powered, they've got unbelievable torque. And if you get a, an arm or a leg wrapped around a capstan, one of these drum-like things that would have rotated and taken lines in to moor the ship, it would just take an arm or a leg off. So obviously, White Star Line doesn't want passengers up there. But on other ships from the era, once the ship was at sea, you can see passengers kind of just hanging out in places where they probably shouldn't. So the question is, was it really that strictly maintained at sea? Probably not. Obviously, this area is in full view of the bridge. Here, it's explained that the, the officers are basically just enjoying it and, and getting a bit of a kick out of it. But yeah, I... I see this as being completely plausible. Now Jack and Fabrizio very well could have walked to the tip of the bow without raising any serious suspicion because none of that machinery is in use at the moment. Since the ship's at sea, it's all stowed, the brakes are on, it's not turning or anything. So, you know, if they trip over, it's probably not a big deal. The infamous million dollar shot, as it's known, this is a giant model of the ship that's actually bigger than most uh, sailing yachts, private sailing yachts, that was built specifically for the film. You can also see here that Titanic is flying uh, what's known as the Blue Duster or the Blue Ensign. Now, most merchant ships of that era would have flown a red version of this flag. So this is a really nice little historical detail because this was actually quite an honor for a, for a merchant ship to be able to fly the blue version of the, the merchant flag, the Ensign. 
The blue version, the Blue Duster, denoted that a substantial number of the ship's officers and crew were members of the Royal Navy Reserve and especially her commander, her skipper. Captain Smith was, in fact, a Royal Navy Reserve officer with a fairly senior rank. And so he had earned, along with many of his officers, the right to fly the Blue Ensign. A very nice little detail that they, they got dead right. Another nice little detail is that as you're flying over the four funnels of the ship, you can see a ton of smoke coming out of them. And then in the fourth funnel, you can see there's just a little wisp of smoke. And a lot of people would say, ah, that's fake, that's wrong, because everybody knows that the fourth funnel wasn't connected to the boilers, it was a dummy, and therefore it wouldn't have had smoke coming out of it. But that's exactly the right amount of smoke it would have had pouring out of it, just a little wisp, because it was actually connected to uh, two or three fairly smoky things. One of those was the only functioning fireplace on board the ship down in the first class smoking room directly below it. There was a flue that led from the fireplace up the fourth funnel. And then down below that were the galleys for the ship. These are the main kitchens for the first and second class dining saloons with big ovens that of course would be creating uh, their own exhaust gases. And so all of that's being sent up the fourth funnel. So it played a really important role in the ship. And this is a nice little detail. I'm sure it would have Possibly even smelt like cooking food from this angle. Yes. Here, yeah, look at this. Oh, look at that, would you? And a bit more than a wheel. So this is the night of the collision, April 14th, 1912, just before midnight. And this is where we start to divert a little bit from, from history. You would watch this and actually not be mistaken for thinking that Titanic's lookouts, the two men depicted here, Fleet and Lee, were distracted. They were looking down at passengers, in this case it's Jack and Rose, but you might be mistaken for thinking that they got distracted and missed the iceberg, turned around, and there it is, sitting directly in front of them. But it's just not true. Lookouts, Fleet and Lee were fairly experienced and trained lookouts. They were specifically on the ship to do that role, to keep lookout in, in regular watches. And that night it was bitterly, bitterly cold. It was miserable up there. You'd be mistaken for thinking, looking at this shot, that the iceberg just appeared out of nowhere, that it was by itself. How could they possibly have missed it? But if you actually adjust for the fact that this is a, a, a movie, that they have lightened it significantly so that the audience can see what they're meant to be looking at, if you adjust the lighting to what it would have looked like that night, you start to get a bit more of an accurate picture of maybe why Fleet and Lee didn't get to see the iceberg until it was too late. And of course, they really weren't distracted. There weren't any passengers about down there, you know, canoodling to, uh, to distract them. And actually, this is interesting because it's where Cameron begins to uh, change the, the narrative a little bit of history and, and place some blame on um, historical characters that probably don't deserve it. You would also be mistaken for thinking from this shot that there was just one iceberg in the middle of the ocean. It's very unfortunate they ran into it, but Titanic was encountering field ice. There were actually lots of icebergs, lots of smaller bergs known as growlers that would have floated kind of along the ship's side. And indeed, the next morning when the sun had finally risen, survivors in the lifeboats were shocked to see themselves surrounded by icebergs. We better get the women and children into the boat, sir. Yeah. This is interesting here because they're showing Captain Smith as being in a bit of a state of shock. And... Fair enough, this must have been a pretty shocking situation for the guy. He'd had a, a pretty good career, he'd been at sea for, for decades, and he knew his business really well. But the general story actually goes that Smith was in command for the entire night. He was on top of things, he was commanding the evacuation, he was doing his very best, and he, he wasn't kind of shell-shocked like he's shown to be in a lot of films. Probably the most important part of this scene is his conversation here with Second Officer Charles Lightoller, who's the fellow that's talking to him, saying, shouldn't we get the women and children into the boats? There was a point where Smith spoke to the two officers who would be in charge of loading the boats for either side of the ship. Charles Lightoller, second officer for the port side, or the left side, and first officer William Murdoch for the starboard side, or the right-hand side of the ship. And Smith essentially told them that he wanted women and children in the boats first. Now, Murdoch, on the starboard side, interpreted that to mean probably what Captain Smith meant, which was to fill the boats with women and children, and then load the boats totally uh, with men if there were extra spaces for, for seating. But Lightoller on the port side had a different idea. Now he mistook Smith or thought he meant women and children only. So even if there was space in those boats, Lightoller was launching them half filled or less because he didn't want men to rush the boats. 
And this reflects really badly on Lytola. He's a really interesting character and he's well worth reading about. You'll fall down a rabbit hole if you read his Wikipedia page. He was later on accused of war crimes and things. So he's a really colourful character to say the least. But he was probably hoping to avoid the kind of scandal, the kind of shame and shock that had resulted in other shipwrecks. In the years before Titanic, there had been a series of wrecks where crew had rushed to the lifeboats at the expense of passengers. Women and children were left behind. There was absolute disorder on board. And so I think that as a company man through and through, he wanted White Star Line, he wanted Titanic to be orderly. This is actually reminiscent of another British shipwreck, the Birkenhead. She was carrying a lot of uh, Marines, a lot of British soldiers on board in the 1800s, as well as women and children. And when she ran into trouble, ran into disaster, the ship was sinking and the order went out, women and children first. They were put into the boats and very famously the men and the sailors and the, the soldiers of the Birkenhead stayed behind and went down with the ship. And so that was seen as like the, the ultimate sacrifice. The selflessness was obvious and, and quite an extreme example of that. And so that's probably what Lightola was wanting to recreate in this instance, rather than the, the kind of panic and, and chaos that you'd seen in, uh, in other shipwrecks in very recent memory. It's just an interesting little conversation. You can kind of see the way Lightola is quite a severe character in this, uh, in this scene. He's played by a great actor. That's right! Come towards me! Thank you! Good! So there's Lightola saying he's, he's only taking women and children, but you will have noticed that there was a little moment where he was trying to get the crowd's attention, they're not really listening to him, and then suddenly the, the massive roaring sound just ceases and there's nice silence, and now he can finally talk to the crowd. And what had happened was Titanic was steaming along at full speed before she hit the iceberg, and so because she stopped so suddenly, all of the steam that was used to power the engines had to be vented out of the ship. And the way that they would do that is they had these massive waste exhaust pipes that were on either side of the funnel there. And they led down into the boilers directly and they could be used to vent that steam straight out of the boilers out the top of the ship. But the downside was the sound was horrendous. And so for quite some time after Titanic hit the iceberg while they were figuring out what was going on and what was wrong with the ship, those funnels were venting steam and nobody could hear themselves on deck. And passengers were freezing cold. It was dark out. They had no idea what was going on. And it was really loud. And so naturally a lot of them went back inside. They didn't want to be there in the first place. And it was just too loud. But fortunately, at around about the time they start loading the first boats, the steam ran out. Titanic's lifeblood, what had been powering the ship across the Atlantic, suddenly ceased. And it's actually... A pretty ominous sign, but in this instance, now it means passengers and crew can hear themselves think it's probably more of a good thing. Scenes of absolute chaos on board the ship. And um, this is completely accurate. I mean, Titanic did get to a pretty extreme angle. Probably not as much as is seen in the film. They think that she probably reached about 20 degrees, maybe 30 degrees maximum when she was rearing up like that. And the film shows it more as like a 40, 45 degree angle, but it's it's really not a huge, um, huge issue because it would have looked like it was 45 degrees. I mean, this is a pretty extreme thing. The sound was overpowering because suddenly anything that wasn't tied or bolted down, like the furniture, like the plates, like all that dinnerware, it's just crashing and, and being destroyed. Sinking ships are shockingly loud. I actually did a video on this a couple of years back where, um, the water pressure actually has a very interesting effect on things like windows. It'll shatter them. It'll blow them inward. All you get while the ship's sinking is the sound of timber ripping, the steel bending, the ship basically renting itself apart. And of course it does actually break into two sections. But then the glass, lots and lots and lots of glass. Anytime a window touches water, if it's not flooded on the inside, after a couple seconds, it'll be busted inwards. And so... There's a lot of sound. It's not a calm, gentle thing. There's just a lot of violence and a lot of noise. So Titanic's lights finally go out. Now this is pretty true. It's thought that Titanic's lights had stayed on throughout the night because her electricians, her engineers were keeping some of the boilers running towards the stern of the ship so they could power the electric dynamos, which gave the ship her light. And just before Titanic broke in half, or around about the time that she did, it's kind of 
up for debate. The lights snapped out. Now, there may have been a couple burning still. There may have been some, uh, some oil lamps that didn't rely on electrical power. There may have been some emergency lamps powered by, by other dynamos. But the, the general consensus is that the lights snapped out black and the ship was plunged into darkness. What you can see in this scene is men down in the, uh, the dynamo gallery, down in the turbine engine room, where there's a massive, essentially like electrical hub for all of the circuits, the major circuits on the ship. And it is absolutely not where you want to be in a sinking ship, anywhere near any of that kind of equipment. Now, were men down there at the time Titanic broke in half? Probably not. The engineers were actually seen on deck right at the very end of the sinking. The men had stayed down there, keeping the lights burning all night, and then they were released from their positions and they were allowed to, uh, to escape up through ladders, so they didn't actually have to get through the interior of the ship. There were ladders that led from their position down in the bottom all the way out through the top through things like engine skylights and that kind of thing. And they were let out. And so they were actually seen on deck. So it's unlikely they, were, they died in this kind of horrendous way that you see in the, in the film here down in the bottom of the ship. They're, they probably were on deck with the rest of the passengers. But it's shocking that naturally uh, the majority of them did perish in the sinking. And it's because they did stay behind, keep the lights burning. And regardless of whether they died inside or outside the ship, it shouldn't take away from their... Um, from their heroics. So in this scene, the rescue ship Carpathia has arrived. And as I mentioned before, the passengers were shocked. Now the sun is up to see that they're actually surrounded by icebergs and there wasn't just one. Carpathia had had a pretty dramatic night. She'd received the distress call from Titanic and made like an absolute bat out of hell to get to Titanic's position. Obviously, unfortunately, they couldn't quite make it because Carpathia was not a particularly fast ship, nor was she ever intended to be. So she did as well as she could. Her Captain Arthur Rostron very, very righteously received awards and commendations for his bravery because essentially he did everything that he possibly could to get his ship there as quickly as possible, to make sure that survivors could be cared for. He even went so far as to get the various doctors who spoke different languages ready and organized, set up in the saloon so that they could tend to passengers with injuries. He got hot coffee and soups and things made up. He slung out lines and ladders and uh, slings that could bring people up if they weren't able to walk. He basically converted his passenger ship that was loaded with passengers into a rescue ship in just a couple hours. And as Carpathia was hurtling through the North Atlantic, she ended up encountering the same ice field Titanic had and almost ran straight into an iceberg more than once. And that would have been a disaster, but fortunately, Carpathia was spared the same fate as Titanic. So it's a really poignant way to actually pay some tribute to Carpathia's uh, efforts that they show the ship at the end of the film here. And it's a really nice nod to the passengers and the crew of Carpathia who did everything that they could to get their ship where it needed to be and to help Titanic's poor people out. So there you have it. It's a classic film. It is an absolute favorite of mine. It is really what got me into learning about maritime history and the Titanic. This and A Night to Remember, which is another classic Titanic film. If you enjoyed this, if you found it interesting, please let me know down in the comments. If you'd like me to check out another Titanic movie or another ship movie, let me know and maybe I can give it a watch and come up with some more historical tidbits and maybe some more goodies. Maybe we'll even take another look at uh, some more Titanic scenes in the future. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.